off a righteous man. They are ordered of God. They are ordered of God. Rejoice for the sin of a righteous man. They are ordered of God. In the time of trouble, God will uphold it. God will preserve it. God will sustain it. In the time of trouble, God will lift it up. So rejoice, your steps are on the middle of God. Rejoice for the steps of a righteous man. They are ordered of God. Time of trouble, God will lift him up. So rejoice with him to hold it of God. And in the time of trouble, God will uphold him. God will preserve him. God will sustain him. In the time of trouble, God will lift him up. Steps of a righteous Amen. man. They are not ordered by men. They are ordered by God. Amen. Hallelujah. Sometimes bad things happen to good people. But the scripture says in the time of trouble, like God supported Amen. Job. Amen. Amen. God will uphold him. Amen. Amen. God will preserve Amen. him. Amen. God will sustain him. Hallelujah. Amen. God lift worship him up. Amen. Worship you. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen. The Bible says God turned the captivity of Job around. Amen. Amen. Gave him twice as much as he had earlier. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Amen. Amen.
Let's bow our heads in prayer, please. Father in heaven, we come to you in Jesus' mighty name. We give you thanks and praise for this beautiful day and for all the good things that you have ordered for us right till this very moment. Even now we pray and ask that your precious anointing will rest upon us. As we go to the word, we pray that the blessed Holy Spirit will open the eyes of our understanding that we may see and perceive and receive from you, O God, fresh understanding of the scriptures. And we pray that Christ will be glorified in all that is said and done this day. May the word we hear bear fruit in our lives. And may we be a blessing in your hands. Precious Father, we thank you because you are the potter. We are the clay. And it is your wisdom and your mercies that we see in operation in our lives daily. We give you thanks and praise, precious Father, for what you have started in our lives, a good work that you will bring to completion. Oh, Father, we bless your name. In Jesus' name we pray. And the church said, Amen and Amen. Today we are going to continue learning about Wisdom Key 18, how to move from weakness to strength. Now, I've shared with you last week about how your weakness is the entry point for demonic spirits to trouble you in life. That's why we are learning about how we can close the door on weakness, how we can move out of that place of weakness and into the realm of strength and how in doing so we can bring glory, honor and praise to God. Today I want to share with you about how very, very important it is to Understand that God will make every effort to reveal your weakness to you before it destroys you. I want to share something which is here on my heart from the scriptures, which has to do with how weakness to desires of greatness can afflict us and make us come to a place where we become insensitive to the needs of others and especially to the pains and travails of others in times of need. I want you to turn with me please to Luke's Gospel chapter 22 and we're going to study this a little bit so you'll understand how God Almighty doesn't just sit and watch to see what is going to happen? God Almighty knows that we have already fallen into sin and we have weaknesses and we have places that are where we are vulnerable. So he alerts us by his Holy Spirit and he does everything in his power to warn us about not remaining in that place too long. He wants us to get out of that place and to enter into a place of victory. Now, in Luke's Gospel, chapter 22, we understand that it was the time of the Passover. And what was happening was the Lord wanted to share, the Lord Jesus wanted to share his final moments on this earth by celebrating the Passover Seder meal. And he wanted to have a very wonderful time in which he would be able to introduce to his disciples the blessing of the new covenant and at the same time he wanted to show all the twelve of his disciples that he loved them till the very end. Now that's very important for us to understand because at the last uh, Passover that Jesus celebrated uh, which sometimes the Christians have addressed as the Last Supper. It's more than just the Last Supper, it's the last Passover meal that Jesus celebrated, the last Seder meal he celebrated with his disciples. We see that seated at the table alongside the other disciples was Judas. And I already shared with you about how Satan entered into Judas and uh, the entry point was the place where he believed that he knew more than Jesus 
and he always had it in his mind that Jesus had no political ambitions whatsoever and it was up to him to somehow engineer uh, the process by which Jesus would be thrust into prominence. Now, we won't go over that again because we already studied it last week. But I just want to show you here in Luke's Gospel, chapter 22, how in verse 22, Jesus is speaking. There's a lot of pain in his heart. Some of the other disciples don't seem to even consider what he's saying. Now, let's leave Judas. Judas is already uh, filled with evil and he has opened the door for Satan himself to enter into him, not just a demon spirit, Satan himself to enter into him and to completely take over his life so that it would be a process from which he would be able to betray Jesus and hand him over to the chief priest. But then what about the other 11 who are seated around Jesus? Now let me read that to you please. And truly, the Son of Man goeth as it was determined, but O unto that man by whom he is betrayed. Now, Jesus is even at that point warning the disciples about his impending death. If you read the previous verse, verse 21, it reads like this, But behold, the hand of him that betrayeth me is with me on the table. I want you to have a highlighter with you, please. And I want you to highlight these scriptures because I want you to know that Jesus is telling his disciples, Hey, listen, seated with us here is one who is going to betray me. Not one of them even let that word that Jesus spoke enter into them. And not one of them even considered asking him a question. What do you mean by this? Or what are you talking about? Who do you think is going to do it? Now all of them are more caught up. Now read the next verse. Verse 23, and they began to inquire about among themselves which of them it was that should do this thing. And there was also a strife among them which of them should be accounted the greatest. Now, as they start asking this question, who is he talking about? Who is he talking about? None of them wants to pursue it to find out who is going to betray our master. Who is going to betray this person who claims to be the son of God? Who's going to betray the one who has done so much of good? Wherever he went, he did good. He healed all who were oppressed of the devil because God is with him. Like we read later, recorded for us by Dr. Luke in Acts chapter 10 and verse 38. Not one of the disciples wanted to pursue that train of thought. In one second, they're distracted and they move into thinking amongst themselves and speaking. Oh, which of them should be accounted the greatest? So, from verse 25 to verse 30, Jesus begins to teach them that strife doesn't produce greatness. I want you to see that because this is part of our understanding about how greatness comes to the believer. Verse 25, and he said unto them, now this is God actually reaching them, because he didn't want them to end up fighting one another and breaking up and walking away and never being able to talk to one another. And he said unto them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them. <coughs> He's bringing before their mind's eye something that they could relate to because they all knew that Rome was throwing uh, its weight around in many, many regions, including the entire area of what was uh, termed by the Romans as Palestine, just to hurt the Jews or 
you know, they call that place Palestine because they address that area as the Philistines' territory. So it was really a corruption of the word Philistine that they called Palestine. Now, he said, the kings of the Gentiles exercise the lordship over them. And they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors. That means every time you see somebody exercising lordship, you find people subservient to them and addressing them as benefactors. But you shall not be so. I want you to mark this down. But he that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he that is chief as he that doth serve. I want you to mark these words down because this is the words that God is trying to communicate to us in our time as well about how greatness comes. Greatness comes by your willingness to serve. Greatness doesn't come just by your exercising of authority. Then, verse 27, For whether is greater, he that sitteth at meat, or he that serveth, is it is not he that sitteth at meat, but I am among you as he that serveth. What a beautiful, wonderful uh, blessing to read these verses. And I want you to please make a note of them as I read it to you from another version of the Bible as well, from the Amplified Version of Luke's Gospel, chapter 22. And let me read to you verses 26 onwards. But this is not to be so with you. On the contrary, let him who is the greatest among you become like the youngest, and him who is the chief and leader like one who serves. For who is the greater, the one who reclines at table, the master, or the one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at table? But I am in your midst as one who serves. I want you to highlight this phrase. I am in the midst of you as one who serves. Very, very important for us to relate this particular word as one that saves with what you will read from Isaiah chapter 53. I want you to write these things down because as you write them down, you learn. And when you learn, it becomes easier for you to understand everything about greatness. In Isaiah 53, we read about the suffering servant. Everything that Jesus did had to do with his serving the purposes of God on this earth. Now, if you want to be greatest, are you serving the purposes of God on this earth? If not, God is trying to reach you with his word to stop you from living in a place of weakness. Because most often people who misunderstand the use of authority end up doing everything but the right thing. Now let me read to you verse 24 in the Amplified Bible. Same chapter, Luke 22 verse 24. Now an eager contention arose among them as to which of them was considered and reputed to be the greatest. The Jesus said to them, the kings of the Gentiles are deified by them, made like gods, and exercise lordship, ruling as emperor gods. Are you listening? Sometimes some people behave like emperors. They believe that they are beyond <clears throat> any form of correction. They are emperor gods and they rule as emperor gods over them. And those in authority over them are called benefactors and well-doers. That means because they are emperor gods, everybody considers them as benefactors. But this is not to be so with you. That's a word of warning from God to every believer, every disciple of Jesus. 
it shouldn't be so with you. On the contrary, let him who is the greatest among you become like the youngest, and him who is the chief and leader like one who serves. So God will do everything in his power to reveal a weakness for prominence or for any other kind of weakness. That's why I told you weakness is not just in one area. When man fell, weakness began to manifest in various areas. Sometimes weakness is in the area of patience, you know, or sorry, impatience. Their people are impatient. They have no patience whatsoever. And so what happens is, this weakness of impatience drives them to do things that they are not called to do. We have an example of Saul. You can write that down. Saul is an example of impatience. He couldn't wait till Samuel came. He wanted to do what Samuel was used to doing and called to do. And in so doing, he lost his kingdom. Impatience is very costly. And it's a weakness that God wants us about. Now similarly, in this case, here is strife, contention, a desire for prominence, a desire to be the greatest. Jesus is warning them, it should not be so. Don't do it. You know, who all were seated there? Were Peter, James, John, <clears throat> all who were chief among the apostles, some who belonged to that inner circle of disciples who were very close to Jesus, like the ones who were with him on the Mount of Transfiguration, all of them are seated there. And yet to them, Jesus is pointedly saying, it ought no, not to be so with you, or it, you shall not, it, but you shall not be so, or don't be like these Gentile emperor demigods. That's not the way you rule. <clears throat> and then, he is addressing one among them. And that's why it's very important for us to know this chapter from Luke is much more than just Jesus talking some few words to his disciples and expressing something on his mind. He is warning Simon about something. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, verse 31, Behold, Satan had desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. Now even before that situation has come, Jesus is warning Simon. Now if you receive a warning from God, it is not meant to be ignored. It's not meant to be countered with a word from you. What you need to be doing is, Seeking God's face for his strength to overcome. In other words, coming before God in humility and clinging to him for victory. Somehow, you don't see Simon having that mindset at all at that time. It's a very different Peter that you're seeing there. I want you to see that, please. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, <coughs> behold... Satan had desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, that your faith fail not. Now you can understand how God is when it comes to his people. How God is when it comes to wanting us to be on the right side. Here is Jesus praying for Simon, while Simon is not praying for himself. How about that? Here is Jesus. He's saying, I've prayed for you. That you will not fall. And still Simon is not saying, Lord, pray for me. He's not asking Jesus to pray. He's not even thinking of prayer. Because we're going to see what he's thinking about. But let's read verse 32. And when thou art converted, strengthen your brethren. Highlight that please. I want you to know, God wants you out of weakness 
and into strength. God wants you to get out of that weak condition for the sake of edifying the brethren. Why does God want you out of a weak situation? That in doing so, not only do you get the victory, but you are able to help others, the other brethren who are struggling with some area of weakness, to get out of that area of weakness and to produce the blessing of fruit in their lives as they cling to the strength of God. And he said unto him, now this is what Peter is saying, or Simon is saying, Simon Peter. And he said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both into prison and into death. And he said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day before that thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. Are you listening? Weakness will make you deny Christ. Weakness will make you deny that you know anything about Christ. Weakness will make you deny everything about what God means to you. That's why weakness is dangerous. I want you to mark that down, please. Denial just, just doesn't come simply. The end result of weakness is you begin to deny First, you live in self-denial. What is self-denial to a man who is living in weakness? He is denying that he is even living in weakness. He starts justifying his weakness. He says this is a fallen world and so all who are living in a fallen world have weaknesses. I am just one among them. That is the first justification. Some others go one step further. They are in a state of self-delusion. They are deluding themselves and denying that they are even in a state of weakness. And then there is a third category of people. They take pride in living in that weak condition and in so doing, they deny Christ himself. Now that is what is going to happen to Peter. The moment Jesus said this, a truly humble man would have asked Jesus, please pray for me. Please pray that I will not come to that condition. Please pray that that will not happen in my life. Although Jesus already told him, I have prayed for you. A truly humble Peter should have at least said, thank you Lord. Thank you for praying for me. There is no thanksgiving. There is no acceptance of what Jesus is saying. Only a brash bold declaration of I'll be with you I will not leave you I will not get away from you even if you go to prison I'll go with you to prison and if they say that you're going to go to death I'm ready to go along with you to die now Jesus says in verse 34 I will tell thee Peter the cock shall not crow this day before that that thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. Now, we have another example I'd like to share with you about how God does everything in his power and makes every effort to reveal to a man his weakness before it destroys him. I want you to come with me to Genesis chapter 4, where we read about the two brothers, Cain and Abel. It's amazing, like I told you, intriguing really, that God never is found a way to talk to Abel about anything at all, but rather chose to address the weakness of Cain. Now it's much more than just God finding fault with the offering that Cain brought. God was trying to reach Cain and tell him, Cain, if you continue down this road, sin is standing like an animal, a wild creature, ready to pounce on you. Now, let me read that to you. But unto Cain and to his offering, Genesis chapter 4 verse 5, 
he had no respect. And Cain was very angry and his countenance fell, or wrath. Like the King James Version reads, And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, or angry? Why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. That means it's not yet come in sight. Cain, you have an opportunity to get things right. Cain, I'm giving you an opportunity to change. Cain, I'm talking to you about, don't continue giving this type of an offering to God. Remember, God is not a cheap God to you. He's creator God. Your, fa your father, Adam, and your mother Eve were created by me. And not only am I creator God, I considered Adam as my son. When you read Luke's Gospel chapter 3 of the genealogy of Jesus, you will finally read about how Adam was called the son of God. Now, keep your finger here and let's just read that quickly so we get this right. You must understand this, please. Let's read Luke's Gospel chapter 3 and verse 38. Which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. So Adam was actually called the son of God. And God wanted his firstborn, Cain, to honor him. Because he was the firstborn, he wanted Cain to come with a fist of everything that he had and bring it as an offering to God. Somehow, Cain didn't think too much about the first. He just brought off whatever he had got from the fields. See, the Bible says that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering. He didn't bring the first fruit of the ground. He just brought off the fruit of the ground. So, God was very disappointed with this man called Cain and yet he is trying to reach him and tell him Cain don't do it because if you continue down this road sin is lying at your door and unto thee shall be his desire and thou shall rule over him that means if you listen to what I am saying you can have the victory you can have the dominion but if you don't he will rule over you and you're going to fall and it's going to be a miserable time for you. Now, God didn't actually tell him, although he was all-knowing, he knew that this fellow was going to do something crazy and kill his brother. He didn't tell him you're going to kill your brother. He's warning him about sin. And it is in our interest for us to respect the warnings of God and to quit doing things that he is warning us about. Look at this. And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against his brother and slew him. You can imagine what kind of uh, weakness was dominating Cain. One is arrogance, another uncontrollable rage, number three, a murderous intent, not a repentant spirit, a spirit of rebellion. You know, all these are weaknesses in men. And that's why the Bible addresses all these weaknesses and shows them to us so we can depend on the blessed Holy Spirit to receive strength to overcome these weaknesses and to move out of that area and into victory. There's one more Example I'd like to give to you, which you may write it down. Because I want to share these uh, examples from you, not only from the New Testament, but from the Old Testament as well, about how God does everything in his effort to stop us from uh, living in weakness and from walking in weakness. If you read 1 Kings chapter 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, and 22, all these chapters, six chapters, you see 
all these six chapters are talking about one person prominently. You may think it is chapters that is talking about the ministry of Elijah, wrong. It's not talking about the ministry of Elijah at all. It's talking about a king called Ahab. Six chapters are devoted by God to reaching this man to get him out of living in weakness and into his strength. Somehow, you read these six chapters, study them. It will surprise you to note how God tried to reach him. Not only did he try to reach him through the prophet Elijah, even finally before he goes to his death in disguise, he tries to reach him through the prophet Micaiah. And you will be shocked to read in 1 Kings chapter 22, that even after being warned by the prophet Micaiah about what is going to happen in the battle with the Syrians, this man Ahab punishes the prophet. He doesn't listen to the warning. Punishes the prophet and sends the prophet Micaiah to the hands of one of his governors and tells him, Give him the bread of affliction and the water of affliction. That means keep him afflicted, persecuted, till I come back in peace. You can imagine how people are when they are living in weakness. So one, his weakness was he listened to Jezebel all his life. Her counsel meant so much to him. And all her counsel was totally away from the scriptures. She was a heathen woman. And her heathenism was revealed by the number of prophets she employed. Over 700 prophets were paid to stay in the courts of Ahab. And they were given money to prophesy what the king would like to hear. In fact, when you read chapter 22, you will read about how 400 prophets were still there employed by Ahab. And it was... These men that he turned to when King Jehoshaphat came and said, let's go out and do battle with the Syrians. He turned to these 400 men, knowing that there was one honest prophet called Micaiah. And all the 400 said, go, God is giving you the victory. You will come back with victory. Till King Jehoshaphat asked, are all these people the only ones here? Are there not someone else whom we can inquire from the Lord? And that's when Ahab reluctantly brings out the name of Micaiah. Now why I'm trying to bring this to you this, in this teaching is for you to understand that you can be a very wicked person. But if you are still in the mind of God, God will do everything possible to reach you. And just because he's trying to reach you, don't think that God can be taken for granted. He's a cheap God. No, God's trying to reach you to try to bring you out of that place of weakness. Remember, this is a king who saw supernatural things like fire descending from heaven. He saw the rains come supernaturally. He saw a man called Elijah run before his chariot just on his two legs while he was riding the chariot furiously to come down the mount, because he was told the rain is going to be terrible, get back. Still, having seen all this, Ahab wouldn't change. Ahab loved to live in weakness. But you must know that God is a good God. And he tries to bring you out of weakness by confronting you and sometimes trying his best to reach you with either a direct revelation from him to you like he spoke to Cain or through the lips of his servants he tries to speak a word of warning to you it's up to you to humble yourself Ahab never humbled himself except that once 
when he heard about how God was displeased with what he did with Naboth and the vineyard of Naboth. But still, he lived in arrogance. He depended on the 400 paid prophets to give him a revelation. He never considered Micaiah of value. Let me just read that to you before I close in prayer. Come with me to 1 Kings. Chapter 22. And... Verse 15. So he came to the king, and the king said unto Micaiah, Shall we go against Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall we forbear? First Kings 22, verse 15. And he answered him, Go and prosper, for the Lord shall deliver it un into the hand of the king. And the king said unto him, How many times shall I adjure thee, that thou tell me nothing but that which is true in the name of the Lord. Now listen, earlier he had 400 prophets. Look at verse 6. Then the king of Israel gathered the prophets together, about 400 men, and said unto them, Shall I go against Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall I forbear? And they said, Go up, for the Lord shall deliver it into the hand of the king. To them he never told what he told Micaiah. That's why I want you to mark this scripture down. He said, How many times shall I adjure thee that thou tell me nothing but that which is true in the name of the Lord? That means all along, Ahab knew that there was only one true prophet, Micaiah. Still he loved the other 400. Remember when he called all the prophets, he called all the yes-men first. And they said, go up. If it, was, if it wasn't for the insistence of Jehoshaphat, Ahab would have listened to the 400 and gone. But when Jehoshaphat insisted, because Jehoshaphat felt something was not right with their prophecy, that's when he calls Micaiah. And when Micaiah comes and tells, them, tells him the same thing what the 400 said, Ahab is agitated. He knows the man is lying. He knows the man is telling him what he likes to hear. So he's saying, listen, how many times have I told you, tell me the truth? It's not that he's loving the truth. Don't get this, when you read this scripture, don't get uh, this man in, into, uh, or look at him in a different light. He's as wicked as ever. He loves to live in wickedness. He loves to live in his weakness. And the king said unto him, How many times shall I adjure thee that thou shalt tell me nothing but that which is true in the name of the Lord? And he said, I saw all Israel scattered upon the hills as sheep that have not a shepherd. And the Lord said, These have no master. Let them return every man to his house in peace. And the king of Israel said, Now you can understand the mindset of Ahab from the next verse. And he said unto Jehoshaphat, Did not I tell thee that he would prophesy no good concerning me but evil? A man who is telling the truth in the name of the Lord is considered a man who is bringing evil tidings. That's how people today look at anyone who admonishes them and tells them get out of weakness and into the strength of God. They think the man is talking evil. He, has, he doesn't have anything good to say of my life. And the next verse I'd like to read to you is, And the king of Israel said, Take Micaiah, verse 26, And carry him back unto Ammon, the governor of the city, and to Joash, the king's son, and say, Thus saith the king, Put this fellow in the prison. And feed him with the bread of affliction and with the water of affliction until I come in peace. That's the arrogance in which people live. They think that in weakness they can have peace. There can be no peace in weakness. Weakness only ultimately leads you to a miserable end. For Ahab, it was death in battle. 
Remember, it was not death as a hero in battle. Because if he had gone the way he was dressed as a king, it would have been different. He disguised himself and entered battle. So there was no heroism in King Ahab's death. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Because I want you to keep this in mind. That God doesn't want you to live in weakness. What is the weakness that you think is keeping you back from doing everything that God wants you to do? It's high time you started humbling yourself and crying out to God and clinging to his Holy Spirit. And putting your trust in him. So you can get out of that mess and into the victory that God wants you to have. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' mighty name, we give you thanks and praise. What a blessing it is to hear the scriptures read to us and for us to listen to the precious Holy Spirit who is trying to communicate and reach out to those who are still living in an area that they shouldn't be in no father. An area of weakness. An area that is keeping them from ex experiencing God's very best in their lives. I pray in the mighty name of Jesus that they will consider the examples that they have heard this day. Number one, the examples that we read of the disciples and their desire for prominence. And then the warning that you gave through your son to Simon Peter. And how he reacted, O oh God. O oh, precious father. We are also touched by the way in which you reached out to Cain. And you spoke to Cain and you warned Cain. Even before sin could enter into him. And he would become the first murderer on the face of this earth. What a merciful God you are, O oh father. And finally, Lord, you have seen how a wicked king Ahab has six chapters of the Bible devoted to him because of your love and mercy and compassion to reach him and to somehow turn his heart back towards you. Precious Father, still this man refused to get out of weakness. He refused to put away evil from his life. Refused to get out of listening to these wrong suggestions and values that his wife was instilling into him about how to rule the nation of Israel, O oh Father. O oh mighty Father, great is thy faithfulness. Even now we pray that there would be people who are listening to the sound of my voice who would humble themselves, repent and come back to you. Because as much as we are looking for the time when Christ would come for the church. We are reminded in the scriptures that you are coming for a church without spot or wrinkle. Precious Father, may that spot and wrinkle in our lives be removed by your Holy Spirit. As we cling to him for strength. As we cling to him for overcoming and enduring power. In the mighty name of Jesus, stretch out my hands towards your people. I pray that you would reach out to them right now, right where they are, and touch them in the name of Jesus. Touch them. Transform their lives. Encourage those who need encouragement. And those who are willing to change and to get out of that weak situation. If it is a rebellious nature or a stubbornness and a refusal to listen to the voice of anyone who speaks the truth, I pray in the name of Jesus that all that uncleanness will be destroyed by the power of the anointing of the Holy Spirit and the blood of Christ. The blood of Christ that gives us the power to overcome sin. May that be applied upon those people's minds and that area, O oh Father. And let them be delivered right now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. There are others who are, Lord, having some weakness in the area of money or some other area, O oh Father, of their lives where they are struggling to overcome. May they be delivered right now in Jesus' name. Let them see that that weakness has already brought such destruction into their lives. Such hopelessness into their lives. So much of pain and agony, O oh Father. Because of their refusal to leave that weakness. O oh, precious Father. Good people have walked out of their lives. 
Loving people have moved out of their lives. Everything of value has gone out of their hands, O oh Father, because of that weakness. May they repent in Jesus' name. Let them listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit and turn away from their wicked deeds and come back to you, Lord. Have mercy. Have mercy. Have mercy, O oh Father, on your children in the church itself. Thank you, Father. We give you all praise, glory and honor. Cover everyone under the blood. And let your name be glorified in their lives, especially during this time. We know, Father, that in celebrating what the church addresses as Palm Sunday, Lord, we thank you because it was a victory that was being revealed right before the eyes of people, the critics, the scoffers, the mockers, as well as the children who are crying out with joy. Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Precious Father. The victory was that the word would come to pass. Just as it had been prophesied by the prophets of old. We thank you Father. Oh blessed Father. Let victory be in the lives of your children. Great victory for your glory. Let every one of them be touched, Lord, wherever they are. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. And everybody said, Amen and Amen. And may the blessing of God the Father, the blessing of God the Son, and the blessing of God the Holy Spirit rest and abide with each one of us, both now and until Jesus comes again. Namri Andavaragi Yesu Christin Kirubayum, Pidavagi Devan and Anbum. To your Parisutta Avianudi Aikim, the mode could a indrum endrum irpadage. Amen and Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Be of good cheer. God loves you. When He <coughs> wants you or reaches out to you, remember, He is doing it with great love. He is not finding fault with you. There's a vast difference between finding fault and reaching out and telling you you don't have to be in that place get out so we already have seen the consequences of living in weakness good things have left your life everything good has just moved away from you sometimes it's people sometimes it's good health sometimes it's the integrity that you sought to build over the years it's all just gone down the drain Please, repent and come back to God. There's hope for everyone. Remember, when Peter would repent later and come back to God, God used him so mightily. Peter's not an example of a non-repentant man. He repented. And then the Bible says he rose to be the chief among all in the church at Jerusalem. He was the main spokesman that God used to bring forth the glory of the cross to the Gentiles. Please believe me, it wasn't Paul, it was Peter. He was the first person God used to take the glorious gospel of Jesus to the household of Cornelius. So remember, God has a good plan for you if you'll only repent. He can rewrite everything about your life when you come and humble yourself before him. God bless you and remember, God loves you immensely. Do share this teaching link with someone else. Remember, when God reaches out to you, you have to let him not only reach out to you, but you have to be a blessing in his hands as well. That's the purpose for which God reaches out to a man. So share this teaching with others. Some of you may say, well, I just posted it once on my WhatsApp status. Don't post it once. Post it as many times as possible. Remember, each day there are people who will access your social media platforms. Every day is an opportunity for you to reach out as a gospel messenger, a good news carrier, someone who will reach out with the love of Christ. Maybe you are not able to stand and deliver a message like a person who is called is able to do. But at least you can share this link with someone a teaching link. 
and see how their lives are touched as well. And in the process, you become the carrier through whom the blessing goes. Remember Andrew in the scriptures was a follower of John the Baptist. When he heard John the Baptist give testimony of Jesus, he left John and followed Jesus. He came and checked out Jesus. And then what did he do? He went and called his brother Peter and said, I think I've found the Messiah. That's what God wants to do in your life as well. This is one good way in which you can reach out to somebody and share the good news of a God of compassion, mercy and correction. God bless you. Nanedu ekariti gavum nadu sarva kalamandu jayamitsunu Nanedu ekariti gavum nadu sarva kalamandu jayamitsunu Alleluya anandame santoshame Make sure you don't miss receiving our free monthly newsletter, The Pulpit, which contains a four-part teaching series on various Bible topics that will help you live in victory. You can read it online by going to Christchapel.in and click on ebook library, where you will find all our newsletters available. To receive a physical copy of Pulpit, you can go to Christchapel.in and click on Join Now and fill in your complete postal mailing address along with your contact mobile number and we will be happy to send it to you free and postpaid. Should you want to receive the newsletter via email, do include your request along with your current email ID. Thank you and God bless.